You can never, ever have too much Christmas cookies. Or maybe you can, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can't have too many Christmas cookies. But during the Christmas season, it feels like the more Christmas cookies, the more eggnog, come on someone, the more presents you get, the better. But there is such a thing as too much. You can't have too much Christmas cookies. You can't have too much eggnog. You can get too much stuff in your house feels cluttered. However, one thing that's promoted during the Christmas season that you can't have too much of is joy. Here's the truth. You can never have too much joy. You can never have too much joy in your life. So how do you, how do I, how do we live with intentional joy? How can we have intentional joy in our lives? Because here's the truth about joy. Joy is something you can choose or something you refuse. Joy is something you can either choose or refuse. For example, Kingsley, our daughter, has recently gone through a stage of her little life that she does not want to wear clothes at all. Like, like never wear clothes. Now, normally because she's home all day, it's not that big of a problem, but it becomes a problem when we want to go out in public. So this became a bigger problem when we went to Christmas Town at Bush Gardens the other week, you know, because obviously it was very, very cold. And even though Aaron and I got her a warm, nice little hat, got her some mittens for her hands, got her a big, nice puffy coat, and even brought a blanket to put in her stroller, Kingsley did not want to wear any of it. She didn't even want to wear her shoes. She didn't want to wear any of it. So throughout the entire time at Bush Gardens, she kept wanting to take off her hat and take off her mittens and take off her coat and remove her blanket. And we had to keep putting it on her, keep telling her, reminding her how cold it is. See, she could choose to be warm or she could refuse to be warm. She could choose to be warm or she could refuse to be warm. It's not like she didn't have the option of being warm. She had the option, but she kept refusing to take it. Now, I think a lot of us, I think you and, and me, when we deal with joy, instead of choosing things in life to celebrate, things in life that feed our soul, things in life that helps others and makes the world better, I think oftentimes we refuse joy and we choose things that, that don't feed our soul, like unnecessary time on social media or spending too much time reading or watching news articles or over committing our time to things that we don't really have time for or even being lazy with our time and procrastinating. Here you go. I believe with my whole heart, God wants you to have a joyful Christmas season and a joyful new year because you can never, ever have too much joy. You can't have too much joy in your life. So what I want to do is I want to give us three ways we can intentionally choose joy this season. So here we go. First one is this. Choose joy by knowing what joy is not. This is a good place to start. It's a good place to start. Choose joy by knowing what joy is not. Joy is not the same as happiness. Joy is not the same as happiness. Happiness is a state of being happy. So happiness is normally connected to something. Your happiness is normally connected to something. It could be like, I finally got a promotion. I got a grande size coffee when I ordered a tall. My favorite sports team won a game. And, and, and so, so it's connected to something and it's, and it's good to be happy. You should pursue happiness. The, the only problem with happiness is if you don't get that promotion. If the tall coffee you order spills in your car or if you're a Cowboys fan, you aren't very happy. And your emotions, your stability is conditional. See, happiness, even though it's good, happiness is conditional. Happiness is conditional. And because happiness is conditional, then the most important things in your life will be 
conditional. If you're only looking for happiness in your life, if you're only pursuing happiness, then the most important things in your life will be conditional. God, for example, will only deserve praise when things are going good in your life. You're not going to praise God in the hard times of life. Instead of paying off debt, spending money makes you happy. Sex, sex makes you happy in the moment, even though you may be in a relationship that you know you shouldn't be in or, you, or you're in a relationship with someone that you know you're going to regret later. But in the moment, it makes you happy. Addictions, well, addictions can make you happy. It can give you a release in that moment, but it's conditional. It's conditional. See, it's good to be happy. Trust me, I want you to be happy, but let's make one thing clear. Happiness is not joy. Happiness is not joy. Second thing, happiness is not joy. I mean, joy is not Joy is not the denial of reality. Joy is not the denial of reality. What we live in a time which we call in the vineyard, the already and the not yet. The already and the not yet. This is the time and space we live in right now, which means Jesus lived, he, he came and he lived the life we couldn't. He died a death we deserve. He rose from the grave and then ascended onto heaven. And now he sits at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning. So we live in a space of Jesus came and now Jesus is making the world right again through you and me, his church, and he's to come again. The not yet, the already he came and the not yet, he's to come again. So since we live in this space, there's still pain. There's still illness and poverty and sickness and hunger. So that means you and I, we still deal with stuff. There's still stuff we deal with. And who's being honest watching our live feed today? Who's being honest right, right now? Just type a yes in the comments if you're dealing with some stuff. You got some stuff going on in your life. See, we deal, we deal with issues. We deal with problems. See, and there's been this unauthentic Christianity that has been taught that is not biblical that basically suggests that if you're a Jesus follower, you don't deal with pain. You shouldn't have fear. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have sickness. And that is just not biblical. See, have you ever talked to a Christian that's like, yeah, man, um, my dog Skippy got mowed down the other day, but uh, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Amen, brother. Can I get an amen? Whoop, whoop. You know, like, like, dude, like, like me. I mean, yeah, God is good all the time, but you can be sad about Skippy. Poor Skippy got mowed down. Like, just be sad about him. See, here you go. It's okay to be upset and angry and frustrated. Check this out. It's okay to be honest. It's okay to be authentic. See, that doesn't make you less of a Jesus follower if you're having a negative day or if you're currently in a real tough season of life right now, which I think a lot of us are. You want to know what it does? It makes you human. It makes you human. It makes you like most of the characters in the Bible. If you read the poetry books of the Bible, you see this honest dialogue between the writers and God, and, and there's this anger and there's this frustration, but yet there's this joy and there's hope. And, and if you look at the Apostle Paul, there's this acknowledgement of tough circumstances and even addictive behaviors that he had that were hard for him to shake. Even Jesus, our Savior, the Messiah, he expressed anger and being upset and frustration. Jesus was full of joy and never denied that, that life realities can be challenging. Here you go. Joy is not the absence of pain. Joy can be your reality even in pain. Joy can be your reality even in pain. Jesus, James, the half-brother of Jesus, puts it like this in, in the Passion Translation. It says, my fellow believers, when it, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you 
can. So, so joy is not happiness. Joy is not the denial of tough realities. This is good news because joy is authentic. And since it is authentic, we can either choose it or we can refuse it. You can choose joy or you can refuse joy. Second way to choose joy is this. Choose joy by knowing God is personal. Choose joy by knowing God is personal. See, joy is personal. Joy is personal because God is personal. I'll show you what I mean by this by looking at the Christmas story. Luke um, 2, sorry, Luke 2, sorry, verse 6 says this. While they were there, the time came for the baby, Jesus, to be born. And Mary gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger. So the miracle of of Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh, God with us, Emmanuel, born in a lowly place. King Jesus, not born in a palace, but in a cave. And this is good news because God, unlike any other stories of deities, Jesus was born in an ordinary place, which said from the very beginning of his life that God that God is personal, that God is relational, that God is relatable to his creation. He's a personal God. We see in the virgin birth, we see this, we see the transcendence of God and the intimates of God. It's this picture of heaven and earth colliding together in the transcendence of God, meaning God's holiness and goodness goes far beyond ours. And this is true of his knowledge and power. But then we see the intimates of God, that God is present and he is active within his creation, within in the human race, even for those who do not believe or obey. Another way to put it is like this. God, through Jesus, is both powerful and personal. God, through Jesus, is both powerful and personal. And this is good news. This is good news for you. This is good news for me. This is good news for our world. Since God is powerful, He is the solution to our problems. Since God is powerful, He is creator of all things. He is above and beyond time and space. He is our way maker. He is the light in the dark. He is the only one who can provide salvation. But since He is also also personal, check this out, since He is also a personal God, He's your comfort. He's your comfort in times of trouble. He's your hope when life brings you disappointments. He's Abba Father. He's closer than a brother or sister. He has compassion on the sick and the broken. He has compassion on your circumstance. He heals the sick. He cares about you. He is Emmanuel, God with us. God in, in, in your life and in my life, is both powerful and he's personal. He's powerful and he's personal. And I want to be practical here as well. I want to be super practical with you guys today. I want to give you a way to, to access the powerful and personal natures of God because joy, because joy is something that you can choose or refuse. Joy is something you can either choose or refuse. And what I'm about to say to you, you're about to say, for real, Jacob, like for real, haven't we heard this a hundred times already? But here you go. If you want to live an intentional life with joy and experience the powerful and personal natures of God, this is what you have to do. Spend daily time with God. Yes, I said it. I said it. You got to read your Bible. You got to pray. You got to spend daily time with God. I am serious. Here you go. I'm going to be bold today. Can I be bold today? I'm going to be bold today. As a pastor, I truly believe I am not, nor is going to church 
supposed to be your primary connection to God. I, I, I truly believe that. See, see, your primary connection with God is supposed to be your personal time that you spend with God, that you spend with God. Some of you are just a five minute decision away from experiencing all that you ever needed in your life. See, some of you are five minutes away from experiencing all that you ever needed in your life. And what do I mean by that? If you started to daily spend five to 15 minutes a day with God, I truly believe with everything inside of me, it will change the entire trajectory of your life. I truly believe that. Some of the decisions that you're making right now, some of the things that are happening in your life, some of your thought patterns, some of the anxiety and the depression and the fear and the loneliness that you're facing, there are a five minute decision away from spending five minutes with God for those things beginning to correct themselves, to get into a place that you become an over overcomer in your life. It's in the quiet time with God that you will begin to experience the power of God in your life, that you will begin to cry out to God and say, God, I need you to come and heal. God, I need you to come and fix things. God, I need you. I trust you. You begin to, you begin to experience the power of God. And while you experience the power of God, you will begin to develop an intimate relationship, a personal relationship with this God. And you will begin to see that even though you make mistakes, even though you're in pain, pain, even though that you have fear, even though you have doubt, God is near and close to you. Scripture even tells us, crazy or not, crazy if you believe in that, Scripture tells us that God, the God we serve, the God that we see in the Bible, the God demonstrated through Jesus, we see that he's near those who are broken. He's near the brokenhearted. He's near those who are crushed in spirit. He's not a God just for the perfect people out there, whoever those people are. He's a God for you. He's a God for me because he's powerful and personal. He's powerful and personal. I mentioned James 1, 2 a little bit ago, but you don't get James 1, 2 without personally spending time with God. Check this out. It says, my fellow believers, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. Check this out. And if anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and he will give it. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to scroll over your failures, but he will overwhelm your failures with his generous grace. See, what are you asking God in your quiet time? What are you asking God in your quiet time? What are you working through with God in your quiet time? Or would you rather post something on Facebook that would take you five to 10 minutes after you check comments and reply back to everyone? Would you rather do that with your five to 10 minutes? Or would you rather spend that five to 10 minutes with your creator God who designed you, who destined you, who made you, who placed you on this earth for such a time as this? Joy, your joy, the joy that you want in your life, you can choose it or refuse it. You can either choose it or refuse it you have to be intentional about joy because my last point today is this. Number three, choose joy by knowing there is actual good news. Choose joy by knowing there is actual good news. There is so much bad news in our world today. I mean, bad news is everywhere. We can't escape it. You know, and I, I, maybe you have ever, maybe you have felt this before. Who has ever just received bad news and it just like sucked the joy right out of you? You felt like you got like punched in the gut. Who's ever just received bad news like that? I remember one time when Erin gave me bad news before. <clears throat> one time she walked up to me and told me, Jacob, you're fat, sick, and nearly dead. I was like, what? Okay, she didn't really say it like that, but basically that's how I took it. So what happened was she came up to me about six years ago. It was, it was the first winter of our, of our married life together. And you know, and after the honeymoon, after the holidays, Aaron and I, you know, we gained some weight, you know. Well, not Aaron. She always looks great. I gain weight. She's perfect. Um, so one day out of nowhere, Aaron comes up to me and she doesn't say, she doesn't say, hey, Jacob, maybe we should get a gym membership. No, nope, she don't say that. 
She doesn't say, hey, you remember when we were dating? We used to go running all the time. You know, maybe we should pick that habit back up. Nope, she doesn't say that because those would be practical things to do when you want to lose weight or get back in shape. Aaron comes up to me with a DVD that said, fat, sick, and nearly dead. And we had to watch it. We had to watch it together. And it was all about a man who started a juice cleanse and lost a bunch of weight because of it. And after the, the, the movie, the DVD was over, Aaron said, we're going to Bed Bath & Beyond right now. And we're buying a juicer and we're doing a 14-day juice detox fast. And so I didn't really have a say in the matter. I was like, what? Okay. And then a couple hundred dollars later, we buy a juicer and a bunch of vegetables and we start this journey of a juice detox. So this is a 14-day juice detox, right? So we can only drink juice. And some kind of cold carrot soups that you can drink with, you can eat with it too. You know, it was disgusting. So with each day, he go, with each day of us doing this juice detox, my life starts to suck a little bit more. My life just gets horrible a little bit more each day. I start to get angry really fast. I had zero joy in my life. I was at the end of my ropes. And now it's just the second day into it. You know, I just, I barely can make it. The book came with, the book that it came with made all these promises about about what a juice a cleanse detox would do to your life it tell, it said you'll feel more energized wrong it says that you'll be more alert wrong it said it will increase your sex life double wrong i wasn't thinking about aaron that way during this juice detox all i was fantasizing about was was chicken wings and, and pizza and a fountain of ranch and unlimited beer i was having a hard time and i was only like four days into this thing so here you go. We go over to Aaron's mom, mom and dad's house for dinner. Aaron asked her mom to make us some salad with olive oil. So we're at the dinner table and I'm staring at, at, my, at my salad. And then this smell, this smell comes out of nowhere. And it's the smell of good news and great joy. It's the smell of steak. Come on. My mother-in-law walks into the dining room with this plate filled with medium rare, juicy, perfectly cooked steak. And I look at Erin and she's like, don't you do it. And I'm like, but the smell, babe, the smell. Then I cave in and I ate that steak and I gave up my juice fast detox thing right there in that moment because I had to either choose joy or refuse it. And I'm telling you this, joy came in the, in the reality of a juicy steak at that moment, okay? See, here you go though, here you go. I think many of us live with the bad news of an unrealistic diet and we choose the things that suck the joy right out of us all the time. I think a lot of us live in a place of just choosing things that suck joy out of our lives. See, you can choose to live with the bad news of depression. You can choose to live with the bad news that you're a victim. You can choose to live with the bad news that your marriage will never get better. You can choose to live with the bad news that you'll always be broke. You can choose to live with the bad news that you deserve to only date unhealthy people that are horrible for you. You can choose to live with the bad news that you can't reach your dreams dreams, that you can't get out of debt, that you can't lose weight, that you can't finish school, that you'll always be insecure, that you always have to be right. You can choose to live with these things. And this is the bad. And this is when bad news becomes personal. See, a lot of us live with this personal bad news. And many people live their entire lives based on the bad news that they received the bad news that they believed about themselves, the bad news of unfortunate events that happen in your life and world. And, and, and honestly, the bad news that the enemy, that the enemy wants you to keep believing, wants you to keep listening to. And what do we see happen on Christmas Day? What do we see happen in the story of Christmas? Of Christmas? The announcement of the Messiah was told first to the shepherds 
It was told to the men of the night's watch because the shepherds were considered a lower class of people. The, theologians even believed that it was said of shepherds that no help must be given to heathens or shepherds. See, the shepherds were just ordinary people like you and me. They had brokenness and we have brokenness and, and maybe you have a past that you're not proud of and maybe you have destructive behaviors that you keep finding yourself in even though you make promises to get out of it. See, the Gospels tells us that God, out of everyone in the world, God decided that these guys, the shepherds, the ordinary people, were the ones to first hear of the miracle of the saving grace of a, of a Messiah. And it was like God was setting into motion that this good news that the good news of salvation, that the good news of Jesus, it's for you, and it's for me, and it's for our world. And it doesn't matter that what you have done, it doesn't matter the mistakes you have made, there is good news for you. See, Luke 2, 8 says it like this, and there were shepherds living out in the, in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord stone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. And why not? Why don't we have to be afraid? Why don't we have to listen to the bad news? Why don't we have to just be sucked into depression and anxiety and all the craziness on our Facebook feeds? Why is that? Because the angel says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy to all people. Good news of great joy to everyone, all people. Not a certain select group of people, but all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is good news. This is actual good news. And this good news announcement that happened thousands of years ago is still good today. And it's still true today. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And what is this good news? What is the good news? The good news was not only Jesus but it is what Jesus meant to the world, what Jesus means to you and I. The good news of the promised Messiah is here and now. The good news of God's grace to his creation. And because of this news, we have great joy in the Greek in the Greek, the word joy is, is kara, which means the awareness of God's grace. So another way to put joy, another way to phrase it, joy recognizes grace, Jesus, and all things. Joy, true joy, this joy, this joy can stand up against all of life's troubles, because this joy recognizes Jesus no matter what. Because this joy is the good news in the middle of your hurt, in the middle of your heartbreak, in the middle of your uncertainty, in the middle of your bad decision making, in the middle of your pain and desperation. Because this joy, true joy, recognizes Jesus in all things. And I can have joy because Jesus Jesus is in me. And since Jesus is in me, there's joy in me that this world, that the enemy, that circumstances cannot take away. So again, I say to you, you can either choose joy or you can refuse it. You can choose it or refuse it. But joy, joy cannot be taken from you. The devil can't steal it. You cannot buy joy and you cannot live off someone else's joy because when good news becomes personal, that's when it becomes great joy. And friends, that's what Christmas is all about. That Jesus came to invite you and me and our world into a personal relationship with him so that we can have life and life to the full because joy recognizes Jesus.
in all things. Bow your heads with me, let's pray. God, we need you. We need this true joy. We recognize you. Even right now, I even feel there's some people who are watching right now that you have been recognizing a lot of bad things in your life. And you have been okay with letting those things stay there. You, have, you, have a, you are recognizing the, either the habits, the decisions, the, the harmful people in your life, and you have been okay with them being there. And I feel right now the Holy Spirit is saying it's time for you to recognize grace. It's time for you to recognize Jesus because that's where your joy is. That's where your joy is. Mm, I even feel like the Holy Spirit, like the angels coming to the, to the, to the shepherds in the middle of the night, they weren't expecting it. They didn't know this was about to happen. Unannounced to them, this good news drops on them. And I just feel right now the Holy Spirit is saying, he's shouting out to you right now. There's good news for your life. There's dreams you can still accomplish. There's relational brokenness that can still be mended. There's healing that can still take place. Forgiveness that can still happen. It's not over yet. There's good news that will cause great joy. Don't give up on your marriage yet. Don't give up on your dreams yet. Don't give up on your kids yet. Don't give up on yourself yet. You have a life to live of true joy, of good news and great joy. So Jesus, we come to you with all these things. We come to you and we say, we intentionally choose joy. We intentionally choose you, Jesus. We choose you. We want you. In Jesus' name, amen.